And hello, friends. We welcome you to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I'm your host, Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We are pleased to be joined by English professor and author Brooks Rex wrote today. We're talking to him about his latest collection of short stories, Thrift Store Coats, stories by Brooks Rex wrote, and we're glad to have him today as he joins us uh, as a professor of English at Brescia University in Kentucky. He was raised near Cincinnati, Ohio, at at the intersection of the Rust Belt and Appalachia. He spent the 2016-2017 academic year as a Fulbright U.S. teaching and research scholar uh, in Siberia, Russia, and was also a 2014 Breadloaf Bakeless Carmago Fellow in Cassius, France. And we're delighted to have him here as we welcome him to talk about his latest collection of short stories. So, Brooks, welcome to Chapters. Glad to have you here. It's great to be here. It's wonderful. I wanted to ask you before we get into your, to your collection of stories about the, the Fulbright Scholarship and, mm -hmm. and that experience. First of all, sure. uh, what is that? How do you go about becoming one? And what was your experience like when you were in Russia? Oh, man. Um, well, I'll, I'll, start with, um, the, I'll start with Russia. It was amazing. Um, the people were absolutely incredible. The, the culture was splendid and phenomenal. And, and one of the things uh, I think that concerns what we're talking about is, is they really deeply believe in making art accessible to people. And so uh, it's just, just tremendous um, opera and ballet theater in the middle of town. And they make sure that there's always uh, a ticket bracket at which everybody can attend. And um, I mean, it's just, just a wonderful place to be, a wonderful place to learn. Um, my students were so amazing. Um, part of, of the reason for that, I had the privilege of working uh, in creative writing with students who are in a country where there's no professionalized creative writing. There's, there's no um, courses that they can particularly take. Uh, in fact, generally, there's no writing course available to them. They, they learn to write through practice, but there's no specific, there's not an English 101 uh, for them to take. So I worked every day with students who had never been told no. And it was so phenomenal. They were so inventive and creative and wild and unrestrained and, and just fun to work with. In terms of the actual grant itself, um, it, was a, it was about a year-long process to apply. I think my final application packet wound up being about 74 pages. Um, and then you, you wait for about eight months uh, while folks uh, go through a, a number of different phases, um, first reading through and sifting through those, um, those documents, um, and then uh, gathering together uh, and, and sort of discussing in, in different layers and levels. There are discipline area um, uh, screeners, and there are uh, just general screeners who look at the quality of your project the quality of your your proposal and then they select a few lucky folks and, and they get to go overseas um, it was I believe the 75th anniversary uh, of the Fulbright program while I was there and it, it was um, it was phenomenal to, to get a chance to be a part of that long-standing tradition um, of the US sending scholars abroad uh, but also receiving scholars back here and just interacting and exchanging globally um, through academics and, and I'm really privileged right now to be one of the readers uh, both for uh, Russian applicants uh, hoping to come to the US at, at a number of different levels um, from uh, undergraduate students up through senior scholars uh, in creative writing and, and filmmaking and, and some uh, literature and some uh, associated uh, proposals and then uh, also with some of the American uh, scholars that are hoping to, to go abroad to, to many different countries. So it's a wonderful um, program that it, it, it was such a huge privilege to be included uh, as part of that and, and an experience that I'll continue to draw from for years. Um, if not the rest of my life. That's great. And, and I have to admit, I, I stalked you on Facebook. I loved all your pictures from over there, <laughs> things you were doing, coffee shops where you were writing, oh, places that you'd seen. It was a wonderful, seemed like a wonderful experience. It really seemed like a, a life, something that would change your life, I would think. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, everything that, that happens there is, is very purposeful, I, I think, uh, on, especially um, the shops, the, um, you know, as you mentioned, the coffee, the, the food. Um, and I, you know, I've likened that a lot to um, a lot of the places that appear in, in the stories in thrift store coats. But one of the first things that struck me when I arrived in Russia was how familiar it felt, um, particularly in Siberia. And uh, I think a lot of that is, is because the region of Siberia 
um, has a lot of similarities with the Rust Belt. We're in the center of the country. We're in very much flyover area. And in Russia, every place uh, is, is really flyover to some extent because uh, you, ground transportation is incredibly difficult. I mean, you, you pretty much need to fly from one city to the next. But, um, you know, we've got that flyover in common. We've got the, uh, the regional name with uh, sort of a stigma involved, whether it's Rust Belt or Siberia, they're synonymous with, with maybe places that, that have seen better times or, or where you don't want to be um, sent. Um, single industry towns, periods of decline uh, for different reasons and in different economic systems, but the same things happen in both places. And um, what we see now is this revitalization and this, this vibrant sort of maker culture um, rising up out of the young population where you know the the large factories are, are closing down the single industries are abating and so now we've got a generation left thinking and asking themselves you know what next i can't go where dad and grandpa went i, I can't do what they did uh, so what do i want to make this life what do i want to make whether it's art or food or culture or um you know you name it. Yeah. So it, it was a it was a great place. Well, it sounds like a great experience. Congratulations for that honor. I, I wanted to ask you about about the setting for your uh, a lot of your stories in thrift store co thrift store coats mm -hmm. is set in the Midwest, and mm -hmm. and I know you teach uh, at Brescia in, in Western Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I kind of look at Kentucky like three different areas. You know, Eastern Kentucky mm -hmm. is very much Appalachia. Lexington, Central Kentucky, very much metropolitan. Mm -hmm. Western Kentucky, I feel like I'm in the South. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at, at a lot of, and I look at uh, Ohio, for example. Uh, I look at that, and, you, and I know you've uh, you've been interviewed and profiled in, in some Ohio media. I look at that as almost three different states. I mean, down here in, in Lawrence County, Southern Ohio, mm -hmm. I feel like we're Appalachia. Mm -hmm. I think Columbus is very much like any Midwest city. Mm -hmm. and then I feel like Cleveland is, is, is close to the busy, frenetic activity of Chicago. It's just mm -hmm. interesting how... The Midwest sure. is kind of divided up, but but what is it about the Midwest and, and, and that part of the country uh, that, that got you interested in putting a lot of your stories there? Well, that I think that's where I spent the bulk of my um, formative years, and and most of the stories in this collection come from watching. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, are, are these stories uh, of you know, are, are these personal stories? Are these things that that happened to you? And and. You know, there are bits and pieces of me uh, in some of the characters, and they'll, they'll show up through throughout the, the text. I think that happens for most writers at some point or another. Um, but for me, having started my writing career as a journalist, I've, I've always been taught to observe. And so the way that my brain works is I'll see something strange, I'll, I'll read something odd, and I always tend to wonder what next. And so the place where I've been the most to wonder what next has been the, the Midwest and has been particularly the Rust Belt. Um, and, you know, I, I was a young child when, when a lot of the what we look at now is, is the decay of the Rust Belt region uh, was going on uh, or, or sort of peaking. And so I remember seeing those shutdown factories. And I, I remember seeing, um, for instance, not, not far from here, but in Portsmouth at one point where somebody climbed up the, the smokestack of one of the factories and hung a little uh, Home Depot for sale by owner sign on the top of the, the chimney trying to bring some levity to a, a tough situation uh, or, or maybe just a prank. Um, you know, who knows what, what the... the um, impetus is there but you know those are things that that really claw into your memory and and so that was a, a lot of the material I had to draw from but you know like you've mentioned um, I think you get so much of America in this region uh, whether it's Ohio whether it's Kentucky West Virginia um, and and I would even go further I, I would say within that region you've got places like Athens that are a, a prototypical college town mm -hmm. you've got you know the west of Ohio where you know where I was raised and in Cincinnati it's a very southern city um, as, as you said correlating with western Kentucky um, and then uh, you get some of the, the sort of Midwestern plains. So you've, you've really got about 80% of America's um, population types and landscapes all within a day's drive. And so if you really want to look at what America is and what problems it faces, but also what its possibilities are right now, I, I think this is, this is the place to look. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about, uh, there's so many great stories here uh, in your collection, but I wanted to ask you about the about sort of the, 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 the penultimate story that the cover is based on, Thrift Store Coats. Mm -hmm. I, I love that story. And I went to that one first because it was it was on the cover of your book. Sure. But, you know, we, we learn a little bit um, uh, uh, about this 
uh, about a, a couple who's going through a lot of what you're talking about. That they're going through and experiencing poverty that, because of the recession, and now they're unemployed. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about, about what that story is about and what, what that couple is going through uh, as they go through this change. Sure. So so in the story, Thrift Store Coats, um, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a young couple. They work together. Um, and on, on the same day, on a single day, they both lose their jobs and, and sort of a, uh, a, an office-wide um, purge at a newspaper office. And so uh, the, the male character, the, the male protagonist, um, sort of takes on this endless string of odd jobs, which for a writer can be really, really odd. Um, and then his, his wife, Mary, the, the female protagonist, um, moves through um, what I've seen a, a lot of friends go through, which is uh, essentially try to try to uh, throw some school at the problem. And uh, she just descends further and further into debt, um, trying to make herself more employable. And what happens is she prices herself out of every available job. And um, you know, I, I wish I wish that that didn't hit close to home. But I've, I've seen a lot of folks uh, in in that kind of a situation. And so they uh, they basically do um, what I think people in this part of the country do, and what my grandma taught me to do, and what my parents taught me to do, and and what my friends and my colleagues and my students do, which is when things go wrong, we just figure out how to make something new out of them. Um, And so this couple goes through a process I'm trying to do just that, and and there are a couple different steps of that process, uh, and and I hope you'll, you'll check out a a copy of the book and, and see what some of those are, but um, they they find themselves in in some situations that um, you know they they started out on the other end of uh, maybe at the the beginning of the text, but but they figure out by the end it's it, it's going to be okay. And another group uh, of people that are experiencing uh, some circumstances that. Uh, are out of their control but are influenced by others is waiting out the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Another story I wanted to ask you about. Because we get that, those characters from all walks of life, but that they're kind of forced into doing something uh, sort of outside of their control. But we get local lawmakers in and politicians in on that particular story sure. uh, and the impact that they have. So um, a hurricane has kind of come and hit the land in which these these folks are, are inhabiting. So tell us a little bit about, about that story because I found sure. that was really interesting uh, uh, two in your collection. Sure. Well, I was a uh, I was a graduate student um, in at Southern Illinois University, um, Carbondale, when when something uh, really close to this happened, and so uh, this is one of those instances of of seeing something in reality and then pushing it farther. Well, what if it did um, go all the way to the the most dire possible? Um, situation and so uh, essentially there's this town of, of Cairo in, in southern Illinois that's uh, famous for two things first of all Mark Twain uh, wrote about it but also it's it's got the um, rather unfortunate nickname of the the city that was killed by racism and um, so there's there's a long history of racial strife and difficulty going on there um, but essentially the the city's protected by a, a giant flood wall um, the Ohio and Mississippi rivers converge there, and the plan, if there's a flood, is basically to shut this gate uh, where you enter into town and blow up levees to the farm fields around it and turn it into a big sunken island, which is essentially what happened um, in parts of New Orleans during hur- Hurricane Katrina. So the Army Corps of Engineers' plan a long, long ago to save the city was to create something that wound up um, maybe maybe not working out so well uh, in the long run. Um, but uh, there was a, an intense flood while we were there. In fact, um, I, I had some super awesome students. Uh, we actually canceled class a couple days, and, and we went and, and helped throw sandbags on the levees. And um, so, so part of the plan for saving Cairo was to blow up levees and, and flood farm fields. Um, the, the people in the town of Cairo and the people who own the, the farm fields had some pretty um, uh, striking demographic differences. Um, and so there, there was sort of a, a push and pull back and forth between two states, between two communities, between two groups of people. And I mean, if, if you're looking for conflict, it was all right there. And it was all this um, tender box uh, ready to go. And in real life, the, the flood stopped just short of having to make a, a really dire decision. Uh, in the book, it, we push it farther and kind of see uh, what people will do when, when things get uh, extreme. Good. Um, I want to ask you, in writing short stories, 
what are some of the challenges that you face or or maybe someone out there thinking about writing a short story or a short story collection. Sure. Uh, what are some challenges you face? What are some, maybe some challenges writers should expect uh, when writing a short story? Oh, man, I, I think the biggest thing is it, it's so difficult to outweird the world. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and I gave up trying to do that a long time ago. Um, there, it's just really, the world is so fascinating and so strange and so fast-paced and so um, sometimes absurd that uh, writing a, a story that will hold somebody's interest um, is, is difficult to do because we're, we're seeing so much happen in the real world. You know, why wouldn't somebody just spend their time watching the news all day? And, you know, and, and maybe that's, that's what we do uh, with a lot of our time. But I, I, think, um, I, I think that's the biggest challenge is, is just to be as interesting as real life. Um, while also trying to construct a story that teaches something or that asks us to question in a new uh, or useful way. And, and that's really my goal. Um, you know, as I said, I've, I've given up trying to be stranger or more interesting than real life. Um, but where I put my focus is, is trying to build something into that story that, that will cause a, a, a useful outcome in the reader. Um, some, some question that will linger with them afterward, um, some idea that will will maybe carry into their daily life and, and become uh, important. Very good. I want to ask you something sort of publishing related in sure. terms of short stories and short story collections. You know, it seems like over the last two or three years we've seen a lot of short story collections coming out and getting published. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seemed like for a while a lot of publishers and agents wouldn't even really touch a short story collection. Uh, but now it's, that trend seems to be changing a little bit. Uh, do you think it's because maybe we, we live in kind of this fast-paced social media society? Or you think it's maybe something else? What, why we're seeing short story collections being valued and people reading them and, and wanting to see more of them? Well, I, I think the feedback that I've gotten from a, a lot of people who have read the book really appreciate the ability to, to just read a piece of it in, in one stretch and then put it down and, and be able to, to pause for a couple days rather than maybe a novel where they feel compelled to, to constantly string through the whole thing. And so that it might be, it might be in some instances nice to, to be able to push away that um, binge watching effect, right? Uh, so I, I think that's one piece of it. I, I think there are a whole, whole lot of reasons um, for a resurgence in short stories. Uh, certainly the attention span uh, is something that's been talked about a lot. Uh, but I, I also think if, if work is good, it'll find an audience. Uh, and, and I hope um, I, I hope that people feel that way about what I've done, but I, I know certainly, um, you know, in reading work, I, I just look for work that's good. And whether it's a, a collection of short stories that's um, completely unrelated or they're interconnected and linked short stories or if they're centered around a theme like this particular collection um, or if it's a novel, if it's a graphic novel, I, I think I think quality will, will find an audience at, at, at some point. Um, in terms of the business aspect of it, I, I'd have to defer to, to my awesome publisher, um, Garrett Dennert. Um, from Orson's Publishing. It, it was based out of Grand Rapids, Michigan at the time he took on the project and, and has, has actually moved operations to um, Seattle. Uh, but Garrett, um, you know, regardless of, of some of those um, uh, financial and, and logistical forces that, that you mentioned that sometimes um, leave publishers reluctant to pick up short story collections, he, uh, he jumped in on the project and um, has been amazing in, in polishing these stories, both as individuals, but also as a collection. And, and I really like that, um, that he took the effort to do that. There's sort of the, the mixing and mastering um, phenomenon where, you know, um, mixing happens to an individual song and in the, the music recording process, but then the mastering comes in and you have to make sure everything works together as a whole album so every song doesn't have a different volume or a different um, feel. And, and so he, he really spent a lot of time making sure that both of those things happen with the collection. And so, so I was really appreciative for his attention there. Great. That's great. I wanted to ask you uh, about another story in your collection that I really liked, Five Meals in Paris. Uh -huh. And and I was reading that. I was fascinated by that story because it was about food, which is always interesting. But uh, as we go through that experience, I almost feel like we're going through a sort of a five or six or seven course meal that you get in France. Sure. Um, so so I, I just love how we get a snapshot of the city. We get a snapshot of the culture. Um, but we don't always know who the, the narrator, the protagonist is. T tell us a little bit about that story. I found that to be really a, one of the most unique stories in your collection. Sure. So, so that was, um, 
that was one of those stories that it, it's a little bit of a risk to put it together. It's, and I, I think what you're referring to, the, the second person nature of it, yeah. it brings uh, a little bit of, of, uh, of, of distance maybe. Um, and so, so I, I love um, playing with that form. Uh, it's something you can't get away with doing too often. Uh, it, it can feel a little bossy and can feel a little bit overwhelming uh, at times. And so, so I, I work to keep this particular story pretty short uh, so that hopefully it's, it's manageable uh, in that way. Uh, but I, I think that that perspective really lent itself um, to this particular story. And, and in the text, uh, we basically have a factory worker from, from Cleveland um, who was told as a, as a younger man um, by, a, by a faculty member at a community college that uh, life was not worthwhile uh, until one had seen Paris. And so everybody else just kind of shrugged it off, but he was taking everything in that class seriously. He was paying money for that class. He, was, he put value into everything that was said, whether everybody around him did or not. And, um, and so he, he saved and he scrimped and, and he kept coins and, and uh, finally cashed it all in um, and was the butt of some jokes but, but found himself in, in Paris. Uh, and, and he sort of ebbs and flows his way through the trip um, on the basis of meals. And so, uh, you know, I've, as, as we talked about with the Fulbright grant and some previous trips as well, the, the Bakeless Camargo um, Fellowship in France, um, I love to travel, and I think one of the things that, that winds up being a, a good touch point for travel is food, because people connect over food, and people remember food, and, and you can remember a meal long after the fact, and so uh, I felt like food would be the, the way that this particular person would remember um, both the good and the bad of his story, and so it, it traces um, the hardship, but also the, the beauty of his trip um, through those five meals, and, and how he... Um, how he navigates those. Yeah, it, it was great. I, I enjoyed it very much, and uh, I've, I've been to Paris, but it's been a long time. But now it makes me want to go back, having oh, read good. that story. And and Wonderful. I love what you said about traveling and meals, because that's one of the things I hear people say all the time. Well, the best part about traveling is eating. Sure. What are you going to eat? Where are you going to eat? You know, those kinds of things. That was really interesting. So, I want to ask you too about what you're working on next. So you've got Thrift Store Coats is mm -hmm. out and, and doing yes. well, getting good reviews and being well received. So what are you working on next? Well, I actually I have a novel coming out. Um, from a, a different press uh, this fall. It's called Pine Gap and it's set in southeastern Kentucky. Um, it's, a, it's about a mining family and um, takes a look at that family's interaction with, um, with geography, with socioeconomic factors and, and difficulties in the city or in the town where they live, um, education, access to education, technology, um, it's sort of all, all of the things that um, sort of get get touched on in, in parts and places during thrift store coats uh, manifest on a little bit bigger scale for this this one family uh, in Pine Gap and so that's on its way uh, very soon and that's in the, the publishing pipeline now I, I just got a, a look at the cover art the other day and I'm really excited about that um, and then um, I have a uh, another linked um, story collection that's also um, set in um, southern Kentucky um, and that is um, essentially a, a group of people who are left behind when the uh, the city's industry moves out and so it, it really follows closely um, sort of the people on the margins um, it, it looks at the uh, the firefighters and it looks at the um, you know the, the teachers at the school when when half their students move out um, you know what what's left uh, and how do they approach that? And so um, that's one that, that's been um, really difficult but really rewarding to work on. Um, and then I have a trio of books uh, coming from the Fulbright experience. And so I have two um, story collections and a nonfiction uh, work that's, that's coming out of that, uh, as well as maybe some other projects too. So I, I stay busy. Uh, there's, there's a lot in the works. Yeah, that's great. And a lot, of different, lot, lot of different genres being represented there too yeah. uh, through that. So that's fantastic. So Brooks, in our final moments with you today, if uh, someone wants to get in contact with you to talk to you about uh, your writing or about your experiences in Russia or to get a copy of thrift store coats mm -hmm. uh, how can they get in contact with you and where can they get copies of your book sure I the easiest place to go for all of that is is brooksrexroad.com 
and uh, there you'll find links to social media and I'm happy to connect uh, with with readers over social media uh, and answer questions there um, I, I also am available to answer questions through Goodreads uh, if, if you're engaged with Goodreads, uh, just uh, search my name and you'll find me there. Uh, but on the website, you'll, you'll be able to find um, ordering information through your favorite online bookstore and direct through uh, Orson's Publishing, uh, if you prefer to buy the book that way. Um, you can order it into your favorite local bookstore um, through... Uh, through the website and and there's even uh, I think I have links up there for about 12 different countries where you can actually purchase <laughs> copies of the book right now so um, they Garrett's done a great job making it widely available and I've tried to concentrate all the avenues and, and methods to get the book um, uh, on that website so that however it's convenient whether it's a, a, a physical book or ebook um, should be able to, to get a hold of it there. Uh, there are also links to individual stories, so if folks want to want to take a look at a, a story first before uh, investing in the book, uh, I'd, I'd love for folks to do that, and, and I'm always glad to, to hear from readers and answer questions and, and take uh, um, kind and critical <laughs> remarks uh, all in stride because that's part of being a writer, and it, it's part of what I love is, is when people interact with the, the text in some way. Fantastic. Brooks Rexroth has been our guest here today on Chapters. We've been talking to him about his latest collection of short stories, Thrift Store Coats, uh, stories with themes of love, of lineage, of poverty, of survival, uh, a great collection of stories about some people that I think everybody can identify with in some way, shape, or form. Brooks, congratulations uh, on the collection, and congratulations on the Fulbright Scholarship, and as you keep writing and publishing, we'll have you back on to talk more about it, so Wonderful. congratulations, thanks. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for becoming. Thank you. We also want to take a moment to say thanks to Chris Dargish and the staff and management of Empire Books and News for providing our on-site support and assistance today. Come down to Empire Books and News and check out a copy of Brooks Rexroth's new collection of short stories, Thrift Store Coats. And we also want to remind you that many of the other author editors and publishers featured on our program have their works for sale at Empire Books and News. So we want to thank them uh, for providing our support each and every episode here on Chapters. And if you are a social media user, we have a way for you to stay connected with what's going on here on the Chapters program via social media. First way you can do that is through our email address, which is right here at the bottom of the screen, lp4 at Zoom Internet. Net. We do ask that you please include your name and the town or community in which you're writing from so that we can keep track of that correspondence. If you like YouTube, we have a chapters page available through the Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube, and that address is right here at the bottom of the screen. Once you plug that in, look for the chapters link, and we've got all of our author, editor, and publisher interviews archived for you there as well. And if you're a Facebook user, we even have a chapters page on Facebook, and that address is right here at the bottom of the screen. What's on our Facebook page is more of our recent interviews archived for you there as well. You can share those. You can share those to your page. You can share those to groups that you're involved with and interact and comment with other viewers of the program through the Facebook page. So if you like Facebook, Facebook, if you like YouTube, you like email, we've made it possible for you to stay in contact with the program through one of those social media platforms. We know many of you have done that. And we appreciate that comment, uh, those comments and that feedback and those interactions so very much. And that will do it for us this time on Chapters, but please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community. Mm -hmm.